So let me start speaking, um, telling you about how to improve recommender systems with uh, human in the loop. And um, this tutorial is provided to you and brought to you by Tloka. Um, we're a unified environment which supports AI and data labeling processes. Um, there's uh, Dimitri, Natalia, Nikita, Maxim, and uh, me, and Fedor, um, who are sharing this knowledge with you. I'm going to start with the introduction. Uh, I run machine learning in Tloka. I'm, I'm going to start this tutorial and uh, uh, hopefully finish with even more people. That's that's the target. So, well, I guess let's start with um, what are the recommender systems and and uh, like what's the goal uh, of the recommender systems? Um, the goal of the recommender systems is kind of right now nowadays is to employ machine learning to produce recommendations. Um, however, the, the, of course, as all of the models nowadays, uh, none of them are you know, none of them are perfect and and uh, uh, but some don't even correlate with human preferences. And, and of course, all of us are trying to make them better, but um, the question is how, how do, we, how do we make them better? And so in this tutorial, we actually show how to gather real human judgments um, from actual humans uh, sitting around the world uh, to um, uh, help, help with uh, building the recommender system basically. Uh, now, the methodology of how to use these human judgments doesn't have to apply to crowdsourcing. Uh, you can use in-house annotators or your friends, anybody else. Um, and um, I guess the idea, you know, the, the goal of uh, what we're trying to show is how to relate a query, which the users typed, to the result of that query. And um, what are, like, what's the... So where is the crowdsourcing coming in here? And, and the thing is the task of relating a query to the results can be done by, you know, in various ways. One, you can, for example, hire, uh, you know, in-house experts, you know, manage basically people in your organization who are going to tell you whether this query is relevant to the result or not. But the problem uh, with this is, of course, um, it doesn't scale very much and it's expensive to hire full-time people. As you can see, we are slowly achieving our goal of ending with more people than we started. So we're on track for that. <laughs> All right. So then there is another approach where you can find, you know, some vendors uh, who have a lot of people on staff. That's sometimes easier for companies or, or, or um, universities to do that. But then it also gets expensive and it's hard to scale. And the crowdsourcing is the approach where you don't hire any companies or, or any people. You basically use technological approach to managing the crowd. And as a result, you get a huge amount of computational power or resulting power uh, in your labeling. Uh, and though you can apply this approach to a variety of different use cases. Um, you can try to check whether your search query is relevant to the products, to the images, uh, to the category of products, to the filters that you tell to the products, uh, you, you put them in the products. Then you can compare side by side the search results. You know, maybe on the left you have one list of search results, on the right you have another list. Uh, which one is better? Uh, identify spam, relevant matches, uh, classify different search queries. That's quite quite a common task. Where you say you're trying to find out if the search query is related to travel or to product or to anything else. So why? Um, well, why, why why do you need this tutorial? And why overall, what's the best way to 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 learn? And the best way to learn is for practice. So we're actually going to do that, not at the moment, but in a few minutes. Um, well, the process overall for kind of using um, this knowledge to improve your systems is uh, can be uh, described as a as an infinite circle, hopefully converging to some. Uh, ultimate recommender system, but let's start with the circle where, you know, let's say you have a system which ranks uh, your results, then out of the results, you sample some of the results which are being shown or which could be shown. Um, yes, okay, uh, which could or could be shown. 
then uh, you, after you sample the results, you perform date labeling, um, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, you get, you know, re results of the date labeling, you aggregate the labels, you calculate the metrics of how relevant your queries are to your results, and uh, you change your ranking. All right, now I cannot. Okay. So, well, you're going to learn the theory of um, evaluating ranking uh, in an offline manner. Uh, you're going to learn the theory of using crowdsourcing for industrial applications. And you're going to practice to actually build data labeling pipelines and run real crowdsourcing projects. Uh, finally, maybe some of you are going to learn how to use this using Python libraries. And that's also a goal. Those are going to be the schedule for today. Well, uh, the 10 minutes is the introduction I'm going to give you. Then there is a 20 minutes part where I'm going to share with you information about the ranking quality metrics. Uh, 20 minutes for human loop and sessions and the practice session about 50 minutes. So uh, brace for a certain fairly long uh, period. But the reason why we have it this way is because during the practice session, we're going to wait for the, the labeling results and it's going to be some coffee break. Finally, we'll finalize, we'll finalize with um, how to convert human labels to ground truth and um, some useful conclusions. Um, we have for those of you who are not in, say, in the industry, uh, we have a, from Taloka a research grants program. Uh, you can use this program to get $100 in credit for uh, for your research, and that's actually a lot um, if you use this approach we share with you. Um, overall, about us a little bit, just in case you're asking yourself, what are these guys doing here? Why are they telling me something? Uh, we have been in this area for uh, many years, been uh, publishing open source libraries, contributing to research in uh, the in the quite relevant conferences such as KDD, CDPR, New Reps, and, and many others. Uh, we collaborate with the universities and actually are building a lot of you know courses in data labeling in various different parts of the world. Uh, we are, actually have a global AI community of practitioners, not only related to data labeling, but beyond that, uh, to machine learning and AI. And of course, we are focused and committed to building responsible AI projects. Nowadays, this is becoming a very relevant area. Um, and we have uh, a, quite a few articles on how to connect uh, your current systems with uh, the requirements to be responsible. Please join our Slack. You can ask uh, some questions. Um, also in the Slack, to some of you, this might be interesting. To, in the Slack, um, we're going to share when is our happy hour uh, going to be. So for sure, you should join. Um, yeah, well, it says here as well, but things might change or just to keep in touch. And thank you. Let's move on to the technical part. Again, thank you for coming. Yeah, just join the Slack. All righty. And you can take this picture as well, just in case. All right. Uh, okay, the next person is Dimitri, I suppose. All right, remote control. Yeah, that's that's probably right. Okay, uh, please. Yeah, so could you please move to the, my slides so I can start? All right. 
It seems to be fine. So shall I start? Yes, please. Yeah, let's do it. So, all right. Thank you very much for introduction. My name is Dmitry Stalov. I'll be remotely today, but uh, still I'll be talking a lot about ranking and its quality at this tutorial. I am the head of research at Taloka, and my, my background is focused on natural language processing and crowdsourcing. So I was doing a lot of things related to quality estimation, and you usually want to use human judgments about some computational things that you came up with. And uh, my part today will be focused on how to measure the ranking quality and what can we do with that. Uh, I'm trying to click and all right, something happens. Give me a sec. Uh, well, uh, all right, so uh, yeah, so now here's the timing. Uh, my part will take roughly 20 minutes. And let's start. So if you run a production system that uses some machine learning for providing recommendations or for information retrieval or anything else, uh, you usually have two kinds of data that might be used for training and evaluating the model. The first one we call offline data and offline metrics. Uh, these data are taken uh, from your logs or from any other data set that you can process at any machine offline in offline term, which means you don't affect your system at the moment. So you take a sample of your logs and you experiment on this. You build the model based on historical data and then you roll out the new model online. And online metrics or online data are data based on the real interaction with your users and the real um, effect made by your uh, system by the real users. And usually uh, it's also called A-B tests. So there are A-B tests that are used to measure the real human interactions. And there are some offline data that are used for uh, improving the model. So, and uh, when it comes to signals, uh, so we, we, we need to gather signals from people and we want to improve our recommender system. We want to build the ground use data set uh, from the user interaction with our system. We will be using offline data because it's safe and it allows, not, uh, allows us not to hurt the users and it's scalable as well. So you can try a lot of combinations of your parameters and so on. And suppose that for every item you rank, for every item you recommend, you can compute some response uh, quality. So you have the object R and you have a quality measure S, the signal. And what you actually want is to aggregate all those signals into a metric. So you want to label every out outcome of your system with some number, and then you can use these numbers to build a metric. And in here are some examples. The first kind of data, it's like search engine data. You have text search, you have a textual query, and then you are trying to rank items re relevant to this query, and you can uh, what is the quality of every item you, you show. If you run a recommender system, you can uh, evaluate the quality of your music feed, content feed, and any other feed. And finally, for content moderation, you can uh, take into account some service quality assurance metrics and so on. And our key uh, perspective today is indeed recommendation. So to calculate a metric, to calculate the single number that indicates how well your system uh, works, we need to estimate the response objects. And we call these response objects qualities signals. And here are three kinds of signals. The first kind is point-wise, the second is list-wise, the third is pair-wise. And to gather signals, we need to perform some annotation of your data. And our tutorial is mostly focused on how to build ground truth data sets uh, from annotated data uh, using a sample of outputs of your system. And here is the example of uh, recommendation. You have a query and you have a set of items. It's actually not a set, but a list of items uh, that shows the results relevant to this query. So the first item should be more relevant the second item should be less relevant and so on. So here are some recommendations, a ranked list of items. And 
for pointwise estimate, given this query and every single response, we can provide, we can map every item to a single number that says how well the subject matches to the query. These uh, evaluations are really simple to annotate. You just go all over the list and you say, this is, for example, five, or this is relevant, this is not relevant, and so on. It's super easy to obtain. You can use crowdsourcing, you can use manual annotation, you can use almost everything, uh, but it has very low resolution. You cannot really distinguish subtle differences between your system versions. So people started investigating this and they found this. You can uh, have different relevance grades. You can use binary relevance, relevant or not, uh, multiple graded relevance. Um, sorry, sorry, not to no, sorry. Okay. I, uh, again, I can, sorry to interrupt. So it looks like there's a request on Zoom. Uh, who's saying the volume in physical conference also should be increased. I don't know if that is a problem or not, but just letting you know. Okay, so um, while, uh, so, and you can hear me well, right? In Zoom. On Zoom, we can get hear it well, yes. Well, great, great. So let me continue then. Uh, so you can use a uh, different notion of relevance to show uh, to indicate the relevance of your system. But uh, point-wise relevance is very low resolu resolutional. So people started to invent more sophisticated approaches. One of the approaches is called list-wise, in which you instead order all objects at once and you try to use ranks as a signal. And you are it's very useful in training machine learning algorithms. So you take the entire list and then you output the signal. It has a lot of benefits, like it offers a lot of information. It also, you judge all the context, but it's expensive and it's actually unfeasible for any realistic scenario. So uh, people started using uh, what we call the pairwise relevance, or pairwise evaluation. You take a sample of your objects. And now you are trying to evaluate the relevance in pairs. So you show the pair of objects and you try to figure out what object is better, A or B, left or right, one or two. And it's simple, it's consistent, but you need to take some precautions to make it work. So, and the slides are changing really slowly. And in our tutorial, we will focus on pairwise evaluation. But if you roll a real system, you should take into account this. In the beginning, just use pointwise evaluation. Then when you have a working service quickly, you can just stick to the pairwise scenario. In our practice, we'll show you the pairwise scenario. Now the metrics. Uh, here are some very well-known ranking metrics which are mean average precision, normalized discounted cumulative gain, and expected reciprocal rank. Let me show some of them. Uh, mean average precision builds on the very well-known formalism of information retrieval. You have a precision and you have a recall. And now you can take uh, the number of key and check the precision at this level key and recall at this level key over the top key element. And this allows you to have a very nice curve called precision recall curve. And this curve uh, has these properties. Recall increases at, at, every, at every step. And at every level of recall, the precision can be arbitrary. And we want this curve to have these properties. It should be maximum for the perfect order, and it should be minimum for the worst order. So everything is a mess. And if we define precision as a function of recall, we can just compute the area on the curve. And this area on the curve for a one query is called average precision. So we just integrate over this function. Uh, but it's, you know, very sophisticated definition. We should take something more practical. And uh, in practice, we usually work in discrete case. We don't have those integrals and we can transform the previous equation into this very simple sum. So at every level i, 
we take the product of precision at i and delta of recall in i. And this allows us to simplify this to the very, very, very simple formulation. And this allows us to compute the quality for one query, for one user or for one item, well, not item, but uh, for one set of items. And to get the final number, to final, get the final metric for our evaluation, we can instead simply average over the number of our lists, ranked lists of objects. The good thing about map is that it's very popular, it's very straightforward, but it does not take into account the grades of relevance. So it works only with uh, binary labels. It's not very convenient. So people started to invent something more and more uh, sophisticated. And one of the things that uh, offers the sophisticated uh, sophistication is what's called uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain. Unfortunately, on my screen, I see I still see mean average precision. Okay, I see it. So we can discuss, uh, define this as this. Uh, we can say now we have grades of every object we have, and we want the objects with the highest grades to be at the top of our list, and we want the objects with the lowest grades to be at the bottom of our list. And for this, we can apply what is called a discounting factor. So at every object put in our list of items, we want uh, to penalize uh, putting the higher ranked item lower than uh, we actually might want it to be. And in order to make this a uh, useful formula, we can apply different discounters. So we can just uh, use the linear discounter in the denominator or logarithmic or even exponential. Uh, but what is most important is that uh, you cannot really compare different models, different outputs on the single number of DCG because it's a function of your ranked items. So we can use another thing which is called ideal DCG, which is the DCG of the perfectly ranked list of items. And then to get the actual metric, to get the actual number that defines the quality of your ranking, you can divide DCG over IDCG. And this allows you to get in DCG at K. And a fun property of it, if K is very, very large and DCG tends to be one. So you might want to limit K to some reasonable number like 10 or 100 or something like this. So it's a very uh, important property of it. But actually, those, uh, those metrics are great. The key problem of them is you might uh, want to take into account not just the grades of your relevance, but actually the way people interact with your system. And that's very important. Look here. Suppose that you have an information retrieval system that provides item recommendations for your queries, but it doesn't make any, it's not really matter. Any rank list can be used here. So you have a list of items and some of these items are explanations of your term. So they're useful for the user. Some of the items are irrelevant. irrelevant. Like if you work with expected reciprocal rank, uh, you don't want mean reciprocal rank. These things are different. There are some original paper references and so on. But what's important, more, uh, important here is that people skip uh, some bottom of your, result, uh, of your results. So you might want to take into account the fact that people can just you know, give up and go to do something else. You want to keep the top ranked results higher and you want your metrics to take this into account. And this is the way for, uh, for handling this. Suppose that we have signal values and we can use a probabilistic model that tries to say, okay, we have the users that work with our system and we have uh, this scenario. The user can start looking at our list from the top. They, if the item is relevant, they are happy and they continue looking. But if the item is relevant, they can be unhappy and then they can either 
go to the next item or they can give up and, and quit. So this metric called expected just proper right exactly model this scenario and this behavior. And here is the formulation. So you have the probability of user terminating the recession at the item K, number K. And uh, here is the metric that takes into account this behavior. So this is the entire number computed using uh, the metric called ERR or expected risk rank. It explicitly takes into account this behavior of giving up. That's very important. Uh, but okay, so we have uh, defined a few metrics, mean average precision, normalized discounted cumulative gain and expected to sparkle rank. So we know how to uh, measure uh, the quality of our ranking using some numbers, okay? You have the single number for your entire um, system. But in order to compute those metrics, you need the ground truth data set. We will do this in the practice. You need your system that tries to predict the ranks. And we also have to perform sampling, right? So we have to sample something for, for building these ground truth data sets. And I'll show you how. Uh, if you have items, well, you, ha you have something for which you sample and produce those ranked lists. You might want to do some reasonable sampling so the data set you gather for offline experimentation makes sense. And here are some strategies. You can pick the most popular one and you will get mostly simple queries. Uh, you will affect a lot of users by providing a reasonable model on this and so on. But you will miss a long tail that you have. If you focus instead on the long tail, you will handle very difficult cases. You will do something really non-easy and it will handle this long tail, but most users might not uh, see it. So the truth is somewhere in the middle. And the idea is you can use a few strategies for this. First, you can just can uh, flip a coin at every object and you can hand, uh, sample P times N objects, P times N queries for which you produce all those lists. Then there is no guarantee that the popular queries will be there. You can instead uh, use reservoir sampling that offers the guarantee that you will get exactly K objects. So you get exactly key object instead of average number of objects, but no guarantees again. Uh, instead, you can do this. You can do what we call stratified sampling. You split your queries or your users or anything else into buckets based on their frequency. And then you order queries by the frequency and you uh, sample from every bucket. And by sampling from every bucket, the, the necessary number of items, you get the exact number of items you might want. And you will, what is really good, you will have your data set reasonably rep represented in your offline data. So that's very, very good property. And it allows you to handle many, many different types of queries from you know, the popular ones, including the long tail ones. It offers you a certified viewpoint. That's really good. But if you have, now we sampled all those queries. For every query, we produce a ranked list. And we are using pairwise evaluation. So we have to sample from this list pairs of items to compare which is better. How to do that? It's not really quickly, uh, it's not really simple. Uh, if you use uh, merge sort, you know that the complexity of the number of computations like n log n is the lower bound. You cannot sample less than this. Uh, there is an upper bound like n square, so all the possible pairs. The reasonable bound is somewhere in the middle again. You can select key n log n pairs, so you perform uh, object annotation multiple times. K is a hyperparameter that's usually no more than 12 and it works really well. So for every sam for every list, you sample K and log N pairs and then you use a crowdsource annotation or any kind of annotation to uh, perform the uh, you know, measurement of this relevance. And when you, and you actually want to build a ranked list of items, to build a ranked list of items, you should use a model called Reddit Terry. We'll focus on this model later in our tutorial that builds 
a ranked list of ground truth items based on these fair evaluations. That's very important and very convenient. Here are some applications and problems. Um, uh, how can you apply all those things? First, you can use those metrics that you built using ground truth data for quality monitoring in continuously. You can use it as a target for improving your model, or you can use it as an acceptance metric when you release the new data set, the new model and new version of your service. Uh, but if you use anything related to machine learning or with humans, you, can, you know that everything can go wrong. So you have to build a set of checks, monitorings. Uh, you have to perform some testing. You have to uh, make sure that your system works and the metric computation process is correct. The data uh, inputs and outputs are OK. And you have to check against the previously related things. Everything can go wrong. Why crowdsourcing can help you? You can use instead in-house experts. We call them assessors. You can trust them. You can sign NDA, but they're expensive and hard to scale. Suppose you uh, are, are working with English. Now you want to use, for example, German. You need to hire the entire team. Not so easy. Crowdsourcing allows you to get the scale. So you have to add a lot of annotators on the platform. Uh, but unfortunately, you have to control quality and you need to compete with other requesters for the annotators. And our tutorial allows you to see how it works. So you will uh, run a crowdsourced annotation process. You will gather the pair with data and you will compute the metrics in the end. However, we found and we claim that our experience shows that you can replicate in very complex in-house annotation processes with crowdsourcing. You will get the same quality. It might be cheaper, it scales well, and it allows you to use any mathematics uh, that can help you. If you want to learn more about this, you can this, see this uh, list of references. And uh, I'm really happy that um, you can use also some open data sets for playing with all those relevance and ranking stuff. So there are two that we recommend looking at. The first is called the track data, text recruitment conference data by NIST. And uh, we at Talok also released some data sets. You can check them out at, on our website. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much. Uh, I'll be really happy to answer questions, uh, maybe in the chat or somewhere, somewhere else. Um, okay, and enjoy the rest of the tutorial. Thank you very much. I can hear you. We can hear you from, from Zoom. Again, on works. Yes. Yeah, but I can but I can control the screen. You cannot? No, no, no. One second. So uh, how about now? Uh, yeah, I think it works. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, well, not you, Nikita, but but in any if anybody in the audience has any questions, or those of you who are online, feel free to ask them in the chat, and we'll hopefully ask. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, then either do this through the chat or just come to the microphone because people cannot hear you otherwise. You're uh, if you're not on the mic. Thank you. Hi, so my question is regarding the uh, list-wise ranking. You mentioned that is actually not feasible in a production setting or in kind of uh, inference time. Uh, I would like to to uh, to get a bit uh, motivation why uh, actually list-wise is not feasible. Uh, because in list-wise, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, list-wise setting uh, requires you to annotate the entire list every time. And if the list is long, it might be very painful to annotate it. So it's all about you know the amount of work you need to be done to obtain the quality of this list. And our experience shows that 
you can realize these requirements by uh, reconstructing this correct ground truth list uh, using pairwise evaluation because it uh, requires much uh, less amount of work from people and you can uh, obtain the same reasonable amount of quality by switching to those lists by aggregating pairwise comparisons. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dmitry. So we're moving on to the third part of the tutorial. Uh, and Nikita is going to share with us yeah. the essentials well, for human in loop. Yeah, actually, we will cover this topic why we can just sort the list by by crowdsourcing. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita Pavlichenko, and now I'm going to tell you about human in loop essentials. It's this called like human loop essentials, but it's like essentials of crowdsourcing. So we will do some practice after this part of the tutorial. And uh, my talk will help you to figure out what is going on. Uh, okay, so my talk will take about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so let's start. Uh, okay, so what is so what are the essential parts of crowdsourcing? Let's just list them. It's the composition, it's the instruction for the performers, uh, task interface, quality control, aggregation, and pricing and incremental labeling. So now we will focus on each of these parts. Okay, let's start from the composition. Uh, when you run some crowdsourcing project, you have a big task. So a big task cannot be done by uh, crowdsourcing annotators. You usually split your big task with some uh, small tasks with we call micro tasks. Uh, and uh, these micro tasks are sent to a cloud of performers. So performers complete only uh, uh, micro tasks and then you reduce the results uh, to get the output for a big task. Uh, so why we why do we need the composition? Uh, because performers are usually non-experts. Uh, so uh, you need to decompose your hard task into small ones that every human can done can 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 do. So uh, and the simpler single task is, yeah, the more people can perform your task, so you uh, get your results faster. And uh, the easier is the instruction for your task. So it, is, it means less work for you. And finally, you get the better quality uh, when you use the composition. Uh, so we will discuss how to decompose your task uh, in, on the next slides. So, but first you need to distinguish tasks of different difficulty levels. And uh, also, you need to control optimized pricing. Uh, okay, so now it also the problem with Zoom, so I don't see this next slide. Okay, so when when do we need to use the composition? For example, if uh, your task requires an answer selected among more than three five options, so it's not possible to annotate ImageNet uh, directly. You can just show a list of several thousand options and require and ask performers to select just one. Uh, and you need the composition when your task instruction is too long and it's hard to read because nobody will read it. Uh, okay. So let's take a look at some cases of the composition. Okay. First one. Okay. We have some image and we want to ask lot of questions. What what animal is in the photo? Is it visible? Is it stay visible? Is it drying? Okay, a lot of questions. So you usually you cannot ask so many questions in a single task. So you run a separate task for each question. Uh, okay. Uh, the next thing, when you need to verify some answers, Okay, we have some object detection task and you need to highlight colors. And it's difficult to just ask to, to select a bounding box because you cannot control your answers. Then you usually ask another performers to check and ver verify the answer of a previous performer. 
uh, some classic examples, like hardcore example of the annotation when you uh, trying to build some kind of Google Maps and you want some uh, info about uh, the organizations on your map uh, and some photos of stores or something like that. And you need many steps to uh, successfully complete this task because you need to ask a performer to come to the point, take some photos and check a lot of things. And if any of these things are done wrong, you decline the task and start again. Okay, the next thing is instruction. Uh, so when you uh, write some codes to, uh, you ask a computer to do some things. So the instruction is your programming code for, for humans. Like you need to explain to humans what, what you want to achieve. Uh, so instruction uh, should describe the goal of the task uh, the interface, uh, algorithms of what people actually need to do, uh, examples of good and bad answers, and the most important thing, thing is algorithms and examples for rare cases, but also some reference materials. Uh, and the rare cases are the most difficult part of the instruction. Let's consider a simple example. You want to annotate white cats. So you show some images and ask a simple question. Is this cat white? Uh, okay, for this cat, I think it's obvious. Like, yeah, it's not a white cat. But what about this cat? Okay, it's it's pretty white, but it has like a uh, kind of a gray head, so gray face. So maybe it's not a really white cat. Uh, and you need to clarify what you mean under white cat. Okay, is this cat white? We have two cats. So, and both of them are not white. So what do you do to, uh, what do you need to do in this case? Uh, is this cat white? Okay, also it's not a cat. So you need to clarify what to do in this case too. All right, okay, once again, okay. And finally, this one, okay. So image just didn't load. Uh, and for all these cases, uh, you need to clarify what to do. And it's difficult to predict all this all, all the situations because, because you didn't see all of the images, yeah? Because if you have seen all of the images, you kind of annotated the data set yourself. But in, in the instruction, you need to clarify what should be done in a not standard situation. And add, text, add some text field to allow a performer to report the case when uh, it's not possible to choose the correct answer. Okay, let's move on to the task interface. When you run some, run some crowdsourcing project, uh, you need to know something just a little bit about uh, designing front end interfaces uh, because uh, it's how your uh, performers communicate with you uh, and put your, yourself in the performer shoes. Uh, you have many tasks at a time yeah, and your earning depends on the amount of tasks you do. So you need to do as many tasks as possible. And these tasks are monotonous. You just uh, see the same images, you answer the same questions. And uh, because of the quality control, you need concentrations because, concentration because you can be banned at any moment. Uh, so you need to remember that not all tasks are suitable for cross-platform use because it's difficult to do some object detections on mobile phones. Uh, and you need to check all the required conditions because performers might accidentally forget to do something or they just can be spammers. Uh, okay. Uh, you need to use minimalistic design. So it's kind of example of bad design because it has too many distracting elements. And you should reasonably, you should reasonably use uh, the space of the screen because uh, every time the page loads, uh, you uh, spend some time to just see the loading screen. Uh, and keep only necessary elements. Uh, for example, if you need to check the translation, you don't need to 
put all the links to all the available translation services. You might choose only two of them. Uh, okay, so the good practice is you put multiple tasks on the page to help save time on switching between pages and put as many tasks that can be done uh, in five minutes. Okay. So you put all our uh, tasks, uh, uh, you, you keep the same width between all the tasks, avoid empty spaces, and put two, three tasks in your Okay. Uh, let's now move on to the one of the most important parts of the crowdsourcing. It's called quality control. Uh, you need to control the quality because, uh, as I said, people will try to uh, earn uh, as as much money as possible in less money in less less time as possible. So they tend to spam. They need tend to lose concentration, and you need to control these situations. So there are usually three types of quality control. Before task performance, when you select the performance based on some, for example, static features like uh, gender, like uh, the region, language, etc. Uh, well designed instruction can be thought of as a quality control. And you have within task uh, quality control. We can use golden sets, as known as honey pots. Uh, you design a good interface. Uh, you control the motivation. For example, you pay more for high, uh, high performance performers. Uh, and there are some tricks to remove bots and cheats, like uh, ban for the quick answers. Finally, we have after task performance, uh, like post verification, see decomposition, and aggregation or consensus between performers and results and uh, results aggregation. Uh, let's move on to the study, the selection of performers. As I said, we can filter by static properties, or we can use some computer properties like browser, browser region by phone or IP address or by skills that you set, set up in your previous project or in your current project or on some exam, etc. Okay. And finally, you need to educate your, perform your performers by uh, starting trainings, exams, uh, rehabilitations, etc. Okay. Uh, one of the most important things in quality control are golden sets, like this, uh, the central part of all the quality control. It's a small set of tasks where you know the correct answer for. Uh, so you can annotate them yourself or choose uh, the answers with high confidence of aggregation, but there are some rules uh, about golden sets so, uh, like distribution of answers in the golden set should be somehow equal to the distribution in the whole set of tasks. Uh, and they should contain rare answers, variants with higher frequency because otherwise you can't control the corner cases. And you, if you have some long-term projects, you need uh, to refresh your set of honeypots because people can remember the correct answer for them and share them and construct some bots and cheat. Uh, finally, you have motivation, where you can assign bonuses for good quality, uh, introduce some gamification like achievements, rewards, et cetera, and uh, set the dependence of the price on the quality. Some tricks to remove bots and cheaters. Uh, control fast responses, uh, check if all conditions are met, like the link has been visited or video has been played. Uh, and yeah, that's a problem. Uh, as I said, post verification is, on, is also applicable to the quality control when the performer gets paid only if his answer is accepted. Uh, you can do your own post verification or run the separate project for that. Okay, and finally we have consensus between performers. So you usually send the same task to uh, multiple annotators. They 
uh, assign some noisy labels, and you drive a consensus between them. But it works only if the most performers have good quality. So if all of the uh, answers for your project are spammed, so it, it, it won't work. Okay, so let's focus a bit on, on it. Uh, as I said, you have uh, multiple copies of each object. Uh, and for example, you can use uh, the most popular answer or some uh, more sophisticated methods like probabilistic modeling, like David Skin algorithm, et cetera. And we will talk about it uh, in the next part. Finally, a bit words uh, about uh, incremental labeling. So it's usually a good idea to uh, get less answers from experts and more answers from uh, performers of unknown quality. And of course, it's a good idea to uh, set up a dependence of your price on quality, but also price should depend on the task design because uh, if you have a lot of tasks on a single page, for example, you should pay more for this page. Uh, it depends on the time required to perform the task. You might control some hourly wage of your annotators. Or it, it depends on some market economy aspects uh, because if you need performance with some specific skills, you need to assign a higher price. And higher the price, uh, uh, less time you, less time you need to uh, wait until the project is complete. And if you get want to get higher quality results, you also need to set a uh, higher price. Okay. So let's conclude something. So we have uh, to achieve good quality and to make our annotations happy, we need good decomposition, simple instruction, easy to use task interface, uh, some quality control rules, uh, use standard aggregation models, and optimize pricing and introduce incremental incremental labeling. So, if any if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. If not, we can, I believe, switch to the practice part. Okay, um, so there are a few questions in Slack and in Zoom, um, but if you have any, so I'm going to read some of them and provide answers here such that the participants here can also know the answer. But if you're also interested, uh, please go ahead to the mic. Welcome. Yeah, and join Slack. All right. So <laughs> one of the questions which is in Slack and actually was asked in uh, Zoom as well is roughly speaking translates to, hey guys, aren't you telling us about information retrieval systems and not about recommender? And there is basically a few answers to this. One is uh, quite often you want to provide some recommendations to the search results, maybe you rank the search results and then on the bottom you have advertised things or anything like that. And this is where you start thinking about, oh, are these results relevant or this is also good? And it's not even about relevancy. Sometimes it's like this, this you know, is, is this result good or not? Another alternative is to look at your queries as users. And basically, instead of asking, is this result, is this recommendation relevant to this uh, query, you are you basically can ask, hey, do you think that this profile of a user, and then describe whatever profile of a user you have, like this user watched these five movies or these three movies or, or whatever, uh, like, do you think this new recommendation might be relevant to them uh, or relates or not? And that's a way of, of modeling. Um, a way of using this approach to and, and basically modeling uh, recommend the quality of recommender systems uh, without the query. So let me go through other questions in Zoom. Uh, the questions on Zoom, Dimitri was answering via chat itself, but 
if if uh, if anyone would like to like follow up again yes. uh but i can read those questions for you if you would like that okay um so let's go to the practice session um Here. Here. Okay. Okay. Hi, all. My name is Natalie, and now we will start our practice session. Um, and it will be quite big, like 50 minutes, but it's hands-on practice and just basic guidelines. Um, imagine that you develop uh, a machine learning pipeline to improve recommender system, and you have a data set of products and recommendations, and you need to get a ranking list of recommendations. And these results you will further use for, for training a recommender system. And during the practice session, we will get a ranking list of recommendations. Um, it's an example of a task uh, for our performers. Uh, what recommendation of the complementary product is better? And this is a soccer net and a soccer ball and basketball. And it's quite obvious that uh, the left recommendation is better, or product A is better than product B. Um, OK, uh, the task is simple. What recommendation of a complementary product is better? Uh, the type of the task will be side by side. Uh, we will have training data for our performers. Uh, as a quality control rule, we will use golden sets. Uh, here is the price uh, and the estimation of time per page. And here is the pipeline. Uh, these are all performers. Uh, we will have training. Uh, we will set a skill for training. And if uh, performers do not pass the training, uh, we will de uh, deny the access to the real pool. And uh, then we'll have a main pool where we get the results. Okay, uh, here is uh, the step-by-step -step instruction. Uh, you can um, download the instruction and where you can see all the necessary steps uh, that you will need. Um, and also there will be a data set with products and recommendations. And we'll have a promo code to use it to, to get real labeled data. Uh, we will also share links in the Zoom and the chat. Um, first of all, you need to go to the Tlokai website and uh, click on Start Now and you have to register. Um, when during the register, you have two options, like as a performer as, and as a requester. And obviously you need the requester part. And here is the promo code, we will show how to implement the promo code and you will have all necessary materials from for the uh, practical part. And we'll start with a quick demo of the platform to you to understand uh, which steps you need. Okay, and Um, here is the requester account. I think we can start with the, yeah, with the very beginning from our website. And we go to start now. 
and log in as a requester, but you need to sign up because we already have registered. Um, and here is uh, the requester's interface. Uh, here you can see all the projects. Uh, for now, we have only one project product recommendation. And you can create various of projects uh, with different templates, for example, image classification with different types of data. Um, for example, sentimental analysis, audio classification, uh, field tasks for performers, uh, different surveys, and some um, industries uh, interfaces. Um, here are users, and you can see different users who already passed your tasks from different regions. And they are all anonymized. You see only country and age. And here is information about skills uh, that you can apply. And for example, this is skill for product training recommendation. We will do it later. Um, and this is information about your profile. And you can implement here a promo code. Uh, for the conference. Okay, it was a quick demo of the platform. And now we will give you some time for download all the materials. And then we will start the practice sessions with all the steps together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, once again, like uh, my name is Maxim. And I'm also like working in Taloka. Uh, if you have some questions or if you need some help to to register in the platform, uh, to to apply the new promo code and to proceed with the uh, tutorial, please let us know. So we will help you. And um, so yeah, but during this uh, tutorial, we'll try to create the project uh, in uh, in this platform in Taloka. Uh, and to label the data with a wild crowd, uh, like online. So that means like uh, we'll wait for for, for the, all the pools will be completed, and after that, uh, we'll do the aggregation. So in fact, like all the tutorial will consist of the like three steps. The first one is just to uh, create and set up the project. The second one uh, is to wait while they will be fully labeled, and the third one is to make an aggregation to see the. Uh, the real like ranking uh, list of the all recommendations for all the projects we ap applied. Uh, there is a question. Yeah. So for those of you online or here, there is a step by step instructions for the practice session in Slack, in the Slack. Yeah. If you missed some sort of something, what we talked. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll I could proceed. Uh, so um, let's start with the very beginning from the uh, from the scratch to to create the project. Uh, second. So I'm going back to Taloka and pressing create project. To create the project, I just like I I, I want to do it from the various from the scratch. So I not use the existing template, just uh, choose the blank one. Over here we have to specify the name of uh, our project. So let it be like uh, uh, choose best 
for the product. And small description is also not required. Okay. And small description for the uh, project, uh, like for performers to understand what will he will uh, do during the uh, during like what what kind of task he will perform. Uh, For example, like, like this one. Uh, like to create the project, there are uh, two steps. The first one is to uh, specify the interface. Uh, hopefully, we have the template for the interface uh, in your Zoom account. Uh, here's a link to the Google Docs. So you could just copy paste everything you see here and paste it in. Uh, the interface section for for your project just a second yeah if you have any questions we uh, will help you just ask or raise your hand So first of all, I will create the interface uh, using uh, the, the the format used to to build in the interface is uh, template builder, which is like based on the JSON format. Uh, over here, you're like specifying the uh, input data and output data, and what the logic behind uh, uh, the the task. So uh, in fact, like uh, we should also add the samples of the input data, so the the preview will look a bit better. Uh, to do this, I'll also switch to, to the Zoom chat. We'll see the input data sample and copy paste it to the interface back. Here we go, yeah. So right now we see that uh, our interface will consist of uh, two blocks, the initial uh, initial product two recommendations for this product and uh, three options to choose. Like uh, one of the recommendations better or both are irrelevant. Uh, after that, we should also add the instructions as it was described uh, by Nikita before. It is really very important to describe what, uh, what like a corner cases uh, the performer could see during the performing his task or like what kind of the task he have to uh, solve and like why he have to solve it like what are the, the main purpose for us to collect all of this data uh, so over here it's also uh, like two options to create the interface the first one is the interface called use like what you see is what you get so it's like simple word document so you could um, change uh, the format and how you want. Uh, hopefully, once again, we already prepared the interface for you. Uh, so not in the interface, but the instructions. So in this uh, Zoom chat, you will see the link for the instructions. Uh, here, the code of uh, the interface is uh, based in like in HTML language. So you also copy paste all you see here and uh, Getting back to the interface settings, there are uh, the second option is uh, to to see the source of uh, of the uh, instruction. So we will have to paste uh, the code in uh, in this section, and after that, get back to the preview. So right now, you will see that uh, uh, the interface uh, looks much more pretty. There are some several examples. Um, 
first of all, uh, here is a like manual task description. So the, the performer will have to look at the product, the initial product and two recommendations and have to choose one of the three options. Uh, Uh, also, there is an information like how he have to make this decision. So basically, uh, like it's kind of situation where he have to buy the product by himself. And there are like two options as an accessorize for the main product. So uh, he have to decide like which one is better uh, based on his own opinion. There are also some like good examples for recommendation and bad examples provided. There are a bit obvious, but uh, just we have to uh, stand these rules for everyone. So first of all, um, all the like the, the main product and its recommendation have to be connected by a common theme. For example, uh, like an iPhone and his uh, uh, case, they have to be compatible with each other. The second one, uh, it's also possible that uh, the rec uh, recommended product is uh, like a piece or uh, the component of the initial product. I don't know, like if you're buying a car, you could also be interested to, to buy wheels for it, like extra wheels. Um, oh yeah, and the third one is just a, simple one that uh, additional functions that uh, uh, would be useful when you're using the product for a uh, recommended product. And there are like two options when the, the recommendation is uh, really bad. The first one is uh, they're absolutely irrelevant, like the, the initial product and the recommendation uh, recommended product. And the second one is uh, that uh, they are perform the same function like uh, an iPhone and uh, uh, your, your new Pixel. So there are like two, two types of the same phones and it's uh, better not to recommend uh, the same product, the same functionality, but the exercise for, for the product. That's like the uh, constraints of our uh, project today for today. And here's also several examples of uh, applying the rules above. The first one, okay, like we see the iPhone, the um, another iPhone yeah, and um, uh, AirPods, AirPods is a nice accessory. So it's pretty obvious that the, the first one is a good recommendation. The second one is bad. Another option is when the both uh, recommended products are absolutely irrelevant. So the performer have to choose both irrelevant. Uh, the third one is uh, like we have uh, a wheel disk and uh, like one of the recommendation is a car. So right now we see that uh, the, the connection is broken because uh, like the accessories could not be uh, like the main product for uh, for the recommendation of the, the whole car. You will not, never like buy um, the car if you're looking for the wheel. So it has to be like work, work vice versa. And uh, like the, the, the final example over here is just uh, there are two uh, good recommendations for the initial product and the performer have to choose uh, by himself which one is better. So we are not creating the bias in, in the instructions, but ask, uh, ask performer to choose by himself. So in fact, that's all for the instruction per, uh, part and for the, the initial project settings. If you need some help, please raise the, raise the hand. Okay. So guys, one, what step you're right now? I can be a, a bit small, small uh, slow down if you need.
So uh, when you finish with the, the initial uh, project settings, like the, with the interface and the instructions, you just press save and uh, here we go. We have the new project created. So after that, you have to create uh, two type of instances inside of the project. This first one is a like training pool, uh, and the second one is a main pool. So the training pool is uh, the pool when we are uh, teaching our uh, performers uh, to to solve our task, and also uh, we are evaluating their uh, the quality, their skill based on the answers. Because like uh, in this pool, where we will upload ten tasks. Uh, for which we already know the correct answers. And we will add some hints in case if performer will make some mistakes, uh, we will show the hint. And based on this hint, he will be able to understand which answer is really correct. And also, like based on these uh, 10 tasks, uh, we will be able to evaluate the quality. So uh, as a like percentage of the correct answers for, for the like initial 10 of them. And we will admit to uh, the main tasks only those performers who will perform, uh, who will have the skill more than 80%. So that means like the baseline of, of the quality is expected is like about 80%. We could also increase uh, this quality if uh, like increasing the threshold or adding some more quality controls. Uh, I will show, show you how to do this. So first of all, let's try, uh, let's start with a train training pool creation. Uh, over here, we will use the same instructions as uh, in the initial project, but uh, for some reasons, you could also change it uh, as you want. So we will need to add the title for this training. Uh, this information will be visible only for us. The performer will see only like the the instructions, uh, the interface, and the tasks themselves. Yeah, so let's, for example, call it like training pool. Uh, in Taloka, all the training pools are free of charge right now. So that means that, uh, that performers will not earn any money completing the training tasks only. The, the All the uh, income starts from the, the main pools when they like, perform the, the main tasks there. Uh, okay, so let's set up the time per task suit. That's also the, the one kind of concept I have to describe over here. So uh, task suit is uh, like a kind of uh, combination of several tasks in one. So in fact, that's like one, one of the page uh, with the tasks which performers will see. And there will be, uh, well, it, it could be several uh, tasks over there, but uh, we will use a uh, combination of like one task per one task page because it's much easier to see the hints in case if they're making any mistakes uh, during the completion of our training. So for uh, the time per task suit, it's okay to set up the 600 seconds to perform. So that means like uh, after 600 seconds, it, uh, if a performer will not answer the, the question, his uh, submission will expire and will not be taken to account. Another option is uh, to set up the retry after option. That means like when the initial skill will be expired for this performer. So right now we are asking this performer to uh, like to re-evaluate the training pools and on every five days, like just to refresh their knowledge and uh, their understanding of the initial instructions. So the other settings uh, is uh, for like how, how the initial tasks uploaded, uh, initial data set, the training data set will be um, assigned to performers. So there is an option that uh, it will not be shuffled and uh, will be assigned in the same order as they was uh, uploaded to, to the platform. Uh, but uh, actually it's better to, to create the new version of the training for all the performers. So they will not be able to cheat somehow to, to talk to each other or like, using the YouTube channels or any other channels to uh, to share their knowledge, to share how they complete the, the task. Uh, so in this, in this case, they will 
uh, we will create the uh, unique version of the training pool for all the performers. So I will switch off this option and I will uh, keep the shuffle on the page option for, for them. And also uh, over here, we'll have only 10 tasks. So that means like uh, we'll ask for the whole full completion of the training pool uh, to, to complete the training. Okay. So now uh, we will need to upload the tasks. Uh, they're already prepared and provided uh, in your Zoom chat. Oh, I see a lot of questions here. Okay, that's all old yeah, things. So the link number five is training data set. So you have to go to by, by the link and download it to your local PC. Uh, now we will upload the training data set. Uh, as I said before, uh, the settings for the task suits will be uh, one task per task suit. Okay. So after that, we'll have to get back to the like, initial project to see the other options of for pools creations. Uh, so I'm just pressing on the name of my project to get back and see the other uh, pools. So right now there is no any pools and you have to create the, 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 the first main pool in the project. Uh, you could also name it as whatever you want. Uh, performers will not see uh, the name of uh, your pool, but if like in the ongoing project, it's uh, very helpful to, to see the different names because uh, you could upload the new batches every uh, every day. And it's better to, to see the difference, for example, like in the dates of upload to, to navigate in the, in the whole batches in, in your project. You could uh, save the, the same name as it is um, like by, by presented by default. Uh, the one thing you have to change is the price per task suit. Actually, it's better to have it uh, three cents for, per uh, task suit. Uh, we'll have combination of four regular tasks plus one control task on uh, task, uh, task suit. Uh, so that means like five tasks in total. And uh, like based on the previous history, we see that uh, the earnings uh, for for performers uh, during the completion of this in, uh, of the task in such settings are good enough to uh, to be aligned with the like average earnings uh, for performers who who know English language. Um, the other option we have to ch change is an overlap. In fact, that's that means like how many people uh, will see and pe perform uh, each task. So uh, in general, when you're um, labeling the data using the uh, uh, Taloka, it's better to specify it as S3 uh, as like the default option. But in our case, we have prepared the data set in this way that there are like several, uh, uh, several uh, the same lines in, in one project. So uh, the overlap is already implemented in the data set itself. 
and also like this option provide you an ability to make the different types of aggregation like a majority vote so if uh, in case of like uh, as as Nikita said before if like two performers will choose one of the option and the third one is another one is the second option so uh, based on the majority vote aggregation the first option for for this task will be uh, applied uh, after that uh, let's go to the uh, other settings of the pool so we have uh, First of all, we have to somehow select our performers. Uh, we will do it based on the uh, language uh, only. So we will choose English knowledge and we'll ask uh, only those performers who know, uh, who have passed the language test in the platform. And there is a, an adjusting tool, uh, which is uh, like based on the previous history of these performers in the platform, uh, the number of the task and their uh, history of uh, completion of this task like on a daily basis. So it's just a um, uh, like simple adjusting tool based, uh, which is like a balance between the speed and the quality. So right now we're not running out for, for the speed and uh, wanna get the better quality. So it's better to move this settings on the, on the on the right side and after that we're going to the most important part it's uh, the quality controls uh, first of all there we should specify the training pool as a prerequisite for our task so that means uh, that uh, only those performers who will complete the training pool will be allowed to to get an access to the uh, main pool uh, the fast responses options should be. Let me let me see the manual actually. Yeah, actually, everything I'm explaining, showing during this presentation is also specified in the in the manual. So you could follow me or the manual, or whatever you want. Okay, I see that some of the images are broken for some reason. Sorry for that. And how is it going? Do you have any questions, problems? Yeah, of course. Um, so 
So if you have a task that you want people to do that doesn't necessarily have a correct set of answers, so I would like people's subjective feedback. Yeah. Do I, is it possible to skip this training section where there really isn't an answer? Um, in training, you do not have like subjective options, uh, but in the main data set, you will have some subjective um subjective tasks and and the next part we will show how to aggregate these results and how to get like listed well, i guess what i'm saying is like i wouldn't be able to create a set that says here are examples of mm -hmm. what's correct and what's not correct would i yeah. just, would i still have to make training examples that kind of are like just select one select the other mm -hmm. it, i think maxim showed like four cases for example recommendation a is obviously better recommendation B is obviously better. None of this is good recommendation. And uh, the fourth part, when you have to decide. And this is, I think, the most valuable part because we want you, like we want um, answers from performers. And you want to, yeah. okay. They don't want to so, maybe, so one of the things with training, it's not really, oh, are these people bad or are these people good? Or, it's more of like to under, to really understand your task, to make sure that the people who are coming to your task are doing what you actually want and just make, make whatever whatever examples you feel like uh, can help with that, right? And so these can be simple examples or maybe even not even related examples to 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 the real task but on the other hand uh examples which show that the performers understand what they've been asked for so well, i guess we have to like wait for a couple of minutes for everyone to to be on the same page as we do literally the same page Okay, just a bit more theory over here. Um, so like during the quality control rules, we have several types of them. Uh, the most easiest of them is like uh, the fast responses or majority votes. Uh, so the fast responses mean like uh, we're taking into account several answers of performer. Uh, so these rules are working online during the, um, the task are performed. So we've taken into account uh, the last five uh, answers, and that means like the the window uh, which is following the answers for all the, of each performer, and uh, we have some kind of constant uh, where we specify how uh, how long does it take to perform one task page for performer as a minimal. So we know that at least he have to spend uh, at least 50 seconds to to complete our task correctly if they're performing a bit faster than it is uh, they will be like stopped and blocked on for for the further task to be performed by this performer and we will start to track this stuff uh, based on the like, after the second uh, fast response for one performer So that's the the rules how how we could ban them uh we could like ban or suspend actually that's pre pretty close stuff but uh, uh there is like different options on how do we want to ban them on the whole other project for uh like my project as a requester all only for for this uh particular pool or for the for for this project okay maybe as a as you already mentioned, uh, as, as you already know, the, like all the projects in Taloka consist of several pools. Uh, there are like three types of them, the training pool, uh, the main pool, and uh, there could be also be an example. So that's like additional stage in this um, 
performer selection uh, based on which you could also evaluate the other quality and to keep only the best of the best performers to uh, to allow them to com uh, to complete your main tasks. Uh, for our purposes, uh, the like ban for one day uh, on a project will be enough. That means like uh, the the answers of this performer performer will not be taken into account uh, as a result. Uh, also, like there is a like one more uh, control rule called majority vote. Uh, it is like the the meaning of this is very common to the control task usage, but without control tasks. So that means like if performers are answering uh, in the way not uh, uh, the same as majority of the performers. So that means like there this this behavior is very suspicious and we want to ban them uh, or avoid them to, to complete the, the further tasks in the in the pool. But uh, actually I, I like more to use um, the control rules based on the uh, control tasks. So the control task is just the task where we know uh, the correct answer, but performers don't know that we know. And there is no difference uh, for performers. There is no difference between the regular tasks and the control tasks. So I will choose the control task as a rule option. Let me see the hint. Uh, so this rule helps us uh, to evaluate the quality of each performer uh, during the online labeling. So we are taking into account a uh, window of five tasks, uh, like the control tasks of each performer. And if uh, their answers uh, not uh, align with the like rent right answers uh, in more than uh, twenty percent of cases, so we will suspend them in this pool. So once again, they will not be allowed to to complete these tasks further. Okay, so actually that's it for the pool creation. Now we will need only upload the tasks uh, to do this. We should also follow one of the links in the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, the, the links number link number six. Just a small overview of the uh, this file structure. So we have several, like three uh, input uh, fields, the initial product, uh, the recommendation A, recommendation B, and the golden results or like control task, uh, correct answer for some of the tasks. So in, in this case, we have 20 control tasks based on which we will evaluate the quality of our performers. Uh, actually, the, the rest of the fields are not uh, really needed, but you could also keep them. 
uh, they will be assigned automatically during the, the, the file uploading. And uh, in each line, you have uh, like three images, the initial product, the and two recommendations for them. So now I can upload this data. Uh, during upload, I will specify uh, uh, the settings for my task suite. I want to. I want it will be. It, it would be uh, the four general tasks plan plus one control task, and also uh, it it is also allowed to assign the partial tasks. For example, like if we are not have enough uh, not labeled uh, main tasks, we could uh, specify that it should be at least like one general task plus one control task per task page. So that's it. Uh, and after that, we're creating the, like we're, we, sh we should wait for the, all the data set will be uploaded to the project and we could launch the project to see the, the progress online. Okay, uh, so uh, now we can start the main pool, but also it is very like very important to, to start the training pool because it's uh, right now it's like a prerequisite for the main pool. So if you will not start the training pool, uh, no, no, nothing, nothing will, be, will work. So I'm getting back to the training pool and press start. Okay. Okay, so now uh, we should wait for a couple minutes to for data to be labeled. Also we can see the progress over here. Uh, the number of performers interested in our pool. Uh, number of completed tasks, etc. Right now it's zero. <laughs> Let's wait for a bit, a, bit, a bit more. You could also preview uh, the task suits in the, in the pool to to see how it will be uh, look for for your performers. So here then like the interface in the mobile phones and uh, the interface for uh, uh, the, the desktop PCs. So there there is like initial product plus two recommendation for the initial products. And this is what I said, uh, the, the task suite consists of five tasks. And actually, you it is like not allowed to submit the task if you will not uh, choose at least one option for, for, uh, for all the tasks here. Here's a hint. So right now I see the progress. There are six uh, people who have passed the training pool, uh, and like five 
task suits are in progress and one of them is already completed. Ready to. We could also see the like who is performer of our task. It's also very interesting uh, and very interesting. So we see that uh, there are all the performers worldwide from the very different countries, and uh, we see the number of tasks completed by them. Uh, it's like a cumulative number for all the tasks, like the training pools and the, and the main pool. Right now, there are like a lot of zeros in the earnings because uh, the, once again, the training pool is free of charge for, for, for us as a performers, as a requester, sorry. During the labeling, you also could see the statistics for all the pools in in uh, in the project or uh, the statistics for one pool directly. Here's an information about like the assignments or the number of like tasks performed uh, in each hour or by by five minutes. And the average overlap uh, in in our project uh, it's uh, constant and equal to one, but uh, there is also possibility to make the um, overlap to be changed based based on the uh, on the quality of the uh, current results and the, based on the confidence of the answers. So we could increase the overlap if the quality is not enough for us right now. We could also see the, the average um, time to complete one task suit. Right now it's uh, 45 seconds. Uh, we want it to be at least 50 for performers to like, to, to answer the, the other the other tasks. So uh, let, let's let's also see on this um, metric. And here is like um, the metrics called uh, earnings per hour. It's like one of the most important one. That means like uh, how much do we pay for our task uh, for the, all the performers uh, in average. Right now it's uh, a bit more than $2 per hour. So it, it's okay for like English, um, like performers with uh, English knowledge. And also like it should be some, somewhere around two two dollars per hour. So that's the real earnings. And we see the quality based on the control tasks. Right now it's more than eighty percent, which is good. And yeah, some statistics uh, for the performers who who was blocked on the based on their answers.
Я 
Сейчас прошу. Давай, да. Okay, so um, right now I have the fully labeled uh, pool. So it's just like the, the, the last step to aggregate the results and to see uh the real ranking and the range between the answers uh like the recommendation for the the, the main product yeah yeah i just want to add something um people ask in, in the audience so the people who are labeling like the, what's happening in the background are real people from around the world are labeling your data sets right now it's not like mock results or anything like that these are actual performers thank you Okay, so um, first of all, we will need to download the results. There is a huge button over here to download them. Uh, you just please take into account that uh, this option to separate assignments with empty row should not be uh, applied here. So just upload the accepted um, tasks and that's it. I'll save it to my PC. The only thing you have to do is like to rename this uh, the file to annotation. I guess annotation. And oh, okay. Uh, this file will be used right now in Google Collab uh, script to aggregate the results. Uh, I guess there is also should be the link to the Google Collab account. Let me check. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, we're a bit running out of time, so we just 
show you how it work uh, so you could repeat the same stuff on on your pc so uh, we're installing the uh, two libraries the crowd kit and rank uh, the first one is used for all the kind of aggregation um oh it's like open source library to to make the aggregation it's not um directly applied to taloka but you could use it for all the type of aggregations please use it and the second one is rank x just for for ranking the built-in library um Yeah, to, to repeat this one, so you, you have the link uh, to the uh, this um, Python notebook. You should clone it to your drive and to, to follow the, the, the same steps as I'm doing right now. We will use a uh, noisy Bradley Terry method to aggregate the results, which is uh, like most applicable for the ranking methods, ranking algorithm. And uh, we have two types of um, global parameters over here. The first one is uh, like the location of your file with the results on the Google uh, Drive. And the second one is the name of your file. So we, we just rename it to the annotation TSV. And the only thing we have to do is to place it uh, nearby the code. Everything will work. So um, just a second. Here we go. Um, like when you will clone the uh, the Python notebook to your uh, Google Drive, uh, the new tab called a new folder called Colab Notebooks will be created. So you have to place the annotation results nearby the the, um, the Python notebook, and uh, the script will work in this way. Here's a like request to connect to my Google Drive. Press yes. Okay. Okay. So here is our uh, file with the results. We have uh, the like all the initial columns plus the output as a result. So that's the answer for of each performer on each pair of recommendations. We could also see the, um, the worker ID. So that's the kind of uh, areas of each performer in the system, plus like the status and the other stuff. And right now we're uh, just changing a little bit the structure of our data frame to be aligned with the, um, uh, with the same format uh, applicable for the uh, aggregation method. So we need to exclude all the golden tasks plus uh, those uh, answers where, where the both irrelevant answer was uh, chosen. Okay, and... Uh... And yeah, so over here we're like uh, running the aggregation method, and here are the results. So we have the link to the like initial product plus uh, the several several recommendation with the uh, like the label. So that's like, like the how how good this recommendation to the initial product, but it's not really useful. So let's do some magic and to see the images of these recommendations. So here are the results. Uh, we have a Lego set as a main product, plus several recommendations. The first one is for organizers, for, for the key toys. The second one is some kind of puzzles. 
And the same stuff for the other products. So over here, we have just displayed just the first two recommendations. You could also like work with, with it somehow to, to change the, the number of recommendations you want to see. For example, like the first five out of 10, I guess there was 10 recommendations for each product in our case. And now we, so that's how we created some kind of the baseline, the, um, uh, the, 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 the good recommendations. And we want to somehow to compare it with the, our algorithm. We don't create any algorithm to make a good uh, recommendation. So we have used the uh, primitive one. It's just uh, calculate the distance, like pixel distance of the initial product and the recommendation and uh, create this ranking. So we just want to compare uh, the results um, of our aggregation of our baseline uh, of, sorry, of our ground truth plus uh, this uh, dummy algorithm. And we use uh, the NDCG metric uh, described by Dmitry to, to measure the quality of our algorithm. Okay, uh, we're almost done. So right now we'll just evaluate the metric and uh, it is almost done. Okay, so here we have the results. Um, the result is uh, about like 0 0.5. So it's pretty close to some kind of random answers. Uh, uh, well, actually that's what we was expected to get uh, using this time, some kind of strange method algorithm to compare the, to predict the, the good recommendations. But uh, like this metric is, uh, is following that uh, like the zero number means that absolutely irrelevant recommendation and one is absolutely good recommendation so we have the uh, the answer is somewhere in the middle so that's that's a good answer uh i want you to do the same stuff by yourself and to see um, uh, how it will work on your machine and uh, i guess thanks a lot for joining us today uh i'm sure that that's that's the final answers right Okay, yeah, basically, thank you very much for coming. Uh, very much hope that um, you learned something.
we are not going to do the last two uh, parts of the lecture, but then practice is more important. Um, for those of you who are here, please come to the front to pick up some cool stickers or other souvenirs. And of course, ask questions if you have any. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Oh.